music. <laughs> Good to see you back, by the way, my friend. What do we got today? Smith & Wesson Model 10. Uh, this was a recent acquisition. Had to pick this thing up. Um, 400 bucks. Local. Um, FFL. No shipping fees. No FFL transfer fees. 400 bucks plus tax. How could you say no in this uh, early 2022 gun craze that's going on? Um, how could you say no to that? You can't even uh, you can't even get a box of ammo for 400 bucks these days. So um, I I did always want one of these. I mean I got a few Smith and Wesson revolvers, but it's like you, there's certain staples that just I don't know. The collection doesn't seem right without. This was always one of them. And uh, there's some interesting history with this specific gun. But let's just get into the history of the model uh, first. Throw out some info. And then uh, I see that there's a lot of videos on this particular gun up there. So there isn't anything really necessarily about its history or anything that hasn't been said. Um, but there's some interesting notes I noticed that nobody really touches on. And maybe we'll, uh, you know, delve into some of those just so that we can, uh, you know, round everything out, let's say. Smith & Wesson Model 10 introduced in 1899 as the Smith & Wesson Hand Ejector Model of 1899. Um, also, Smith & Wesson Military and Police called the M&P, commonly called the M&P, or... The Smith & Wesson Victory model had a few different names along the uh, along the lines, but it didn't become the Smith & Wesson Model 10 until 1957. That's when it actually got that model designation. Before that, it had these other names, but it was basically the same thing. Little changes along the way. Um... Even when it became the Model 10, then there were changes. You know, there was 10-1, 10-2. I'll run through, the, uh, run through them here. Hold on a moment. So there you go. You get to see some of the model changes there while I got my coffee. Got to have my coffee. So... Yeah, so uh, 6 million of these things produced, which made it the most popular handgun of the 20th century. Uh, they made them in 2-inch, 3-inch, 4-inch, 5-inch, 6-inch. They were even some 2.5-inch special contracts. I think one was for the New York State Police. So if 2 inches is too short and 3 inches is too long, you could always look for one of those. Um... There's just so many claims to fame with this thing that you could just go on forever. It's, like it's used everywhere. But an interesting little rabbit hole you could go down is November 22nd, 1963. This was uh, used by Lee Harvey Oswald to kill J.D. Tippett, the police officer who um, ran into him. Uh, in some, uh, you know, Houston neighborhood, not far from uh, Dealey Plaza, which, uh, you know, led to him getting caught. And uh, supposedly there was a description out. He was walking down the street. J.D. Tippett pulled up, questioning him through the passenger side of his car, got out of his car, and uh, Lee Harvey Oswald shot him uh, with a Model 10. And... Um, I think here's a photo of it right up here of the actual gun. Now, what went on was this was all part of the conspiracy because there were issues with what shell casings were left behind, what bullets were removed from 
Officer Tippett. And so they were like, if you have shell casings from this this brand and then bullets from that brand that didn't really match, there were questions over how many rounds were actually recovered, how many shots there were, missing shell casings. And, um, and also, supposedly, they weren't able to match those bullets specifically from that gun because the gun was rechambered but not rebarreled so the bullets were traveling down i believe a barrel that they were saying was larger than it should have been for the i don't know what caliber actually what these two calibers were what what it was rebarreled for what it was rechambered for and what the barreling was i don't i don't know i'm not sure if you can even see what it says on the in the picture there but but basically, they were saying that it would be impossible to match the bullets to the gun unless, or to each other, unless all the bullets were fired from the same manufacturer of ammo, which wasn't the case. It's just, it just, it so perfectly leads to just a conspiracy theory, because in this conspiracy theory lineology, they're actually putting like J.D. Tippett as part of the the mafia conspiracy, like the mafia killing of Kennedy that they were going to eliminate Oswald and he was part of it. I, you know, I don't know. I, uh, I, I look at all that information. It gets, it gets so crazy, but a model 10 was at the root of this chunk of the conspiracy. And it's, you would think it's all over once you deal with like, you know, how many times, how many shooters shot at Kennedy? Where'd the bullets come from? How many shots were there? Grassy Knoll, all that stuff. You could spend a lifetime just researching all of that. And then to know that even when that was all over, there's even a whole bunch of craziness involved with the shooting of a cop, um, you know, a few miles away, uh, and at like 45 minutes later, um, which led to Oswald's capture. And he did have a, this gun on him, but supposedly they couldn't ballistically match it to the bullets. And, the, you know, it's just, it's just, that, that's, that's a whole other story, you know, that you could probably uh, write novels on, you know. And, uh, and a Model 10 was at the base of that. So, uh, yeah, Model 10 history, introduced in 1957. This is a 1966 model. Okay, so that would make it a 10.6, 10, sorry, 10-6, 10, 10 which were made from 62 to 76. Um, the 10-6 is pivotal in the history of the Model 10 because during the 10-6 production, there was a prototype run of 357 guns, 357 chambered guns in 74, called the Model 13. Uh, they were made until 99, and they were, well, you say, like, well, isn't that the Model 19? I mean, here's the Model 19. We've done a video on it. It's a K-frame that is, uh, was, was specifically made for 357. It's called the 357 Combat Magnum, I would suppose the moniker for this is. Um, it is different in the fact that it has the uh, partial underlug here. But, um, yes, these were, these were different. These were actually started to be manufactured earlier. But this, just strictly as the Model 10, they did also chamber these in 357 as the Model 13. See, it gets complicated, but uh, stick with me here. Follow me. But, um, but yes, but the, the history of this guy, that's really cool. Let's just dig into that for a little bit. Let's see, what else do I have here? I don't want to miss anything. Uh, we're going to be talking about the NYPD a bit because this is an ex-NYPD gun, and that is confirmed by the, uh, the guy that I bought it from, took it in as an estate sale from a uh, deceased uh, NYPD officer that carried this thing for his entire career. I believe I should have wrote all this down when he was telling me, but he was giving me info, but I, I, it was before I was really seriously considering purchasing it. So, but it was, uh, 
somewhere around a 25 to 30 year career in there, which, um, you know, it looks every bit of that, but um, then that's what makes it cool to tell you the truth. I still haven't decided what I'm going to do with it in that respect. And am I going to, how much am I going to clean it up? I mean, this is exactly the way I got it. This is right out of the holster handed to the FFL. He don't clean anything. Um, that's old like this. I, I know for a fact I've bought a lot of stuff from him before. He does not. He doesn't get into that. He just takes it in and sells it. And uh, this is so. This is right out, right out. You know, right out of the holster. Do you keep it like this? I mean, that's part of its allure is where it came from. You know, its history. But uh, hey, let me see. I don't want to miss anything here. So NYPD. They moved to the Model 10 in 1926. Um, it was right around then, I believe, also that they moved to the 38 Special. They were using they were using this gun and the Colt uh, the Colt Official Police, both chambered in 38 Special. Um, 1960 to 1978, they also had the Dan Wesson Model 11 in there. And, uh, there's a lot of con convoluted NYPD gun history here that I scratched out, like, on a piece of paper the size of a gum wrapper, so you have to, <laughs> you have to bear with me. They also had the Ruger Police Positive Service 6 available in 1979. It was all revolvers, all 38 special. The Ruger Police Service 6 was was uh, more commonly chambered in 357. Um they did make it in 38. It wasn't as popular, but that's what NYPD used. They never had 357 um they never had 357 authorized for use for for NYPD. Now, this was a staple for so many years. I mean, growing up, I was born in the 60s. Growing up, I just remember seeing this, being interested in firearms even as a kid, just seeing this as the butt sticking out of the holsters. I'll, I'll remember it. I'll never forget it. See how worn this one is here, where the checkering is even almost all gone? Notice how it's on the top, not on the bottom. And this part sticking out of the holster, you'd say, why didn't it wear evenly? When you stand, it just it's easy. Your hand just sits right there. If you ever see a cop just stand around in a corner, it's almost like a, it's almost like a habit just to stand with your, you know, you're standing around with a gun um, that somebody could just grab right out of your holster. A lot of times it's just common that you just stand with your hand just on it just to even secure it. After years and years of that, look at how it's worn right across the top like that. That is pretty cool. Let me see, is this important? No. So... What happened to the revolver with NYPD? Okay, here's the story with uh, why we don't carry, uh, why they didn't carry revolvers up until this day. The big switch happened in 1993. In 1993, in 1993, NYPD switched to 9mm semi-autos. You had the SIG P226, the Glock 17, or the Smith & Wesson Model 5946. And that was in 1993. Um, they were still allowed, cops that carried the revolver were still allowed to carry the revolver until fairly recently, August 31st, 2018, Police Commissioner James O'Neill made the decision that the 29 cops that still had 38s had to switch to the um, current 9mm offerings. 29. You'd think if there were only 29 left, they would just let those guys peter out and retire and not have to, like, you know, make a change. Because, you know, a change like that, what if, like, two days later the guy has, like, a accidental discharge and and somebody gets killed you say well for all the this whole career guy had a 38 you had to force him to have the nine millimeter 29 of them can't, can't imagine that that was a priority but that was august 31st 2018 so they are out of uh they're out of uh nypd um 
on-duty NYPD hands right now. And uh, why did that happen in 1993? I'm coming up with two things that were the the, the uh, catalyst, let's say, for this change. And number one, everybody knows about the April 11th, 1986 FBI Miami firefight where FBI agents Jerry Dove and Benjamin Grogan were killed. Um, I got some pictures up here. Now, this wasn't necessarily a change of necess necessitating a change of the guns they were using, um, but the ammo. It was basically a wake up call to all law enforcement agencies that, you know, things are getting real now. And uh, I think it was a Ruger Mini 14 that one of the perpetrators had there with 30 round clips. That I mean, you know, that's uh, that's serious firepower. That's um, it was a wake up call to all law enforcement that they really need to take a look at what they're using, what ammo they're using, tactics, everything. They're huge wake up calls. So that was that was a huge catalyst to start thinking. But the actual reason for NYPD specifically. Oh, and by the way, with with this FBI incident. There's a book by, Eric, his name is Ed Mir Mirales. Mir Mirales. Ed Mirales is how I would pronounce it. Um, I just now, doing research for these, um, doing research for this uh, video. See, I don't have a tremendous amount of firearm knowledge, I'll be honest with you. I'll let you know a little secret right now. I do these videos, but um, I started doing these videos really because I would get a firearm or I would you know, research something, I would get into something new. So just, just ending up with one of these in my lap, let's say. And then I start doing a lot of research. Some things that I'm doing research on, I had heard about, but I didn't really know a lot about some of it. I didn't know anything about. And so, you know, it's like, it's just a whole, that whole learning process to me was so interesting. It's what made me do these videos is to be like, hey, look, look at how cool this is. You know, it's cool, but look into this, look at these different things. And just to spark an interest for people to even start doing research on their own on these topics, on these things. It seemed too fascinating to just keep to myself. And that's, that's really what I wanted to talk about is, hey, look what I just learned, not, hey, look what I know. You know what I mean? And, um, and again, this is one of those things. And um, poking into it and really looking into these things, this uh, Miami firefight, again, I mean, of course I've heard about it. I've seen videos on it. It's been talked about. It's, it was such a pivotal thing, but made me want to buy the book of Ed Mirales, who was one of the FBI agents that survived this whole encounter. And um, I have that book coming on the way. Um, Amazon sells it. You should check it out. I forget what it's called, but if you just put his name in or you, if you start poking around looking at that story, you'll find it. But it's Ed, M-I-R-E-L-E-S. I'm sure if you put his name into Amazon, you'd find it. So maybe I'll do a video on this uh, this book and this, uh, this story. It sounds like it would be interesting. But again, this is something I didn't really know about at all. I had heard the name, but I didn't know the incident really much of it. And this was the reason for NYPD seriously looking into and making some changes with their guns was police officer Scott A. Goodell, who was killed June 28th, 1986. He was 22 years old. He had 11 months on the job as a police officer. He worked in the 101st Precinct, which is was in uh, the Rockaways, Queens. Um... And he uh, got into a gunfight. Him and his partner showed up to a call. Somebody was saying that there's a guy running around waving a gun. Him and his partner split up. One went one way, one went the other way. They figured they'd try to, you know, in case the guy runs out the back kind of thing. You know, one of those kind of things. And, uh, and uh, Scott Goodell met up with the guy in an alleyway. And uh, they got into a gunfight. The guy that uh, he got into the gunfight with had a semi-automatic 9 millimeter handgun. And um, Scott Goodell had his Model 10. And in the middle of the gunfight, 
After six rounds, he had to stop and reload. The perpetrator didn't and uh, wound up closing the distance and shooting him in the head and killed him. And that is why uh, one of the reasons why the NYPD made some changes. What changes did they make? Number one, they went to speed loaders. They let the officers, why they wouldn't let them carry the speed loaders before that, I don't know. Maybe they were allowed to carry them if they wanted, but now it was mandatory to carry them. These are realistic snap caps, by the way. Not to uh, put a halt on the story, but uh, once you start, guys start seeing ammo, I don't want anybody getting nervous. Um, these are realistic snap caps. They're completely inert. There's no primer. There's no powder. There's no nothing. They're uh, totally inert. And they're excellent for doing demonstrations like this, showing how the guns load, how speed loaders work, for instance, without worrying about anything ever happening because they're completely inert. Uh, check, uh, check them out online. Um, they love to support this channel. Um, I do not get paid by them or anything, but they like me and I like them. And you will like them too if, <laughs> if you go to the website check these things out and buy some just buy a caliber buy one caliber. they're cheap they're really not expensive buy one caliber and i'm telling you you're gonna buy a set for every caliber gun that you own trust me um yeah so scott goodell um listen to this this is interesting he was killed by a 32 year old guy all right so where he was 22 this guy was 32 uh, who was in the country illegally. June 9th, 2021, just recently, less than a year ago, this guy was paroled, deported back to the country he was from. Uh, and, he, and and when he killed uh, uh, the cop, Scott Cadell, when he killed the police officer and they caught the guy, they found that he was also guilty of killing another guy. Like uh, some drug dealer, uh, drug deal, something that went that went wrong, and uh, and um, he actually was convicted of both killings, and this guy was paroled June 9th, two thousand twenty one, and deported back to his country, where he can, uh, you know, now enjoy the rest of his life. What a crazy! How does somebody like that get out? That blows my mind. I mean, all political. Stuff aside, because I don't like to be political, uh, you know, on, on this channel, but that does not make any sense. That should be a life sentence. I'm sorry. I, I always thought, isn't that capital murder? I mean, at one time, that was like the death penalty. It's like, all right, you know, you don't believe in the death penalty or, you know, fine. That's There's definitely an argument that could be made against the death penalty, but I can't see how an argument could be made against releasing him back like fr how are you free after after that uh, insane well anyway um where are we well there's a uh, there's a dog named after uh scott goodell that works in the counterterrorism canine uh unit and uh he definitely uh you know carries on carries on his memory as an officer um, but let's not forget this guy, and uh, let's certainly not forget that his uh, his killer was released. So, speed loaders. They introduced speed loaders to uh, help out, but apparently that was just for a little while, because by 1983, they abandoned the, uh, the revolvers uh, completely. So, um, the speed loaders... What these things, if you've never seen one of these guys, and again, just in case you just tuned in, these are completely inert. You uh, are able to just use these things like that to just drop all the rounds in all at once. And if you get if you get proficient with these, you see if you look inside, you can see, see how it locks them, locks them in place. If you get proficient with these things, you could reload pretty quick, but... I mean, when they, it says Glock 17 there, the information I have, I know they use Glock 19s now, um, but if they were using Glock 17s, I mean, I think those were 17 plus one back in the day. I mean, how could you 
You cannot argue. You might sit there and argue over the power of the nine millimeter round and what and whatever, as opposed to the uh, the thirty eight. Because you know the thirty eight, it had been through um, some changes too, where there was the thirty eight um, special. They were plus P, where they they upped the, the 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 firepower of them quite considerably over the years. It went different incarnations of this round to make them more powerful. And 38 is, I think it's like 9.1 millimeter. It's about like the same size, let's say, bullet. Um, but even if you didn't argue, just like the, the stopping power, of which I'm pretty sure 9 millimeter is definitely more anyway. But it's just the amount of rounds that you had at your disposal without reloading. Uh, that definitely cannot, cannot be argued. But the um the change they said at first was there were a lot of accidental shootings accidental discharges and it changed kind of like the the revolvers were just so simple and so basic and just the the amount of pressure you could put on the trigger without it firing was was so much more than the um you know they had to take the glocks and the sigs and heavily modify them they actually call it a new york trigger and and that's where it comes from. I think it's 10 pounds, 12 pounds. What, what is it that they had to modify the semi-automatics for? Insane. You know, they, they had really, really had to modify the trigger pull to match this trigger pull. And uh, I'm not sure if cops were ever allowed to um, go single action, you know, to cock the gun and keep it in a ready position like this. Because, man, these things have a hair trigger, man. You just breathe on that trigger and the hammer drops. So I'm, I'm not sure if they were ever even allowed tactically to do that. They might have always had to work double action. Not sure. I could, you know, see if I could ask, you know, some gray-haired retiree cops if they, if they ever were allowed to do that. But, um, but yeah, you know, here's an interesting thing. All right, we'll, uh, we'll end on this. This is another rabbit hole you could go down in. Maybe somebody could help me here because... I couldn't really get enough information to really make a lot of sense here, you know, to like just completely nail it home. One of the changes, I'll throw the picture up here. The changes from the 10.6 to the 10.7 was that, and I didn't know what the hell this meant. So again, my knowledge um, was increased just by buying this, messing with it, doing research to do a video, and then sharing it. The, um, now I forgot what it's called. The ring, <laughs> the, uh, hmm. am I going to have to, am I going to have to pause this video and go look for it? I'm looking for my Smith & Wesson book. Hold on, I'll be right with you. Where's my Smith & Wesson book? History of the Smith & Wesson. Here it is. Uh, by Benfield. Gotta love this book. It's old. And uh, it's the something ring. What the hell is it called here? I'm never gonna find it in here. Well, it's this ring right here. And I'm really, uh, Really showing my ignorance by not knowing what it's called because I've just been researching it for like three hours. I'm done. I'm getting old. That's what it is. But it's uh, it's right here. It's this ring here that they supposedly moved it from the yoke to the cylinder. And uh, we'll zoom in a little bit. And it's right here. You see how it's connected to the cylinder. So what that is is that. When you fire a revolver, a huge amount of the fire blast comes out of this gap right here. And this cylinder needs to rotate smoothly. And you see it rotates. There has to obviously be a gap here. They make the gap here. And they do that by putting this ring right here. Now, supposedly, on the 10.6, they, they moved this ring. It was attached to the yoke right here. 
and they moved it to attach it to the cylinder. But this one is already on the cylinder. So there's a chance that the NYPD armorers would make updates to the guns. So as Smith & Wesson updated the guns, they would make these updates. So I looked at it, I expected from what they're saying, here it is, 10.6, right? Should be on the yoke, this ring right here. And that ring is there to offset. So you see now there's an offset between where the fire blasts out of, which is right next to the cylinder. And it can't get inside that gap right here to foul the rotation of the cylinder. Because if this gets fouled and it doesn't turn, it affects the trigger pull, it affects everything. Because the trigger, when you're pulling the trigger, you're rotating the cylinder. See? So if this is made hard to turn, it's going to mess up everything. So it looks like this was already changed. It's a little odd. Um, I didn't know what to make of it. I wanted to know for sure. So I was pulling up like non-NYPD 10-6 guns to see if that ring was attached to the yoke. And I, I couldn't find pictures to confirm that as a matter of fact as a matter of fact i was finding pictures that were confirming the opposite that they all looked like this so uh just uh mad confusing i just uh and and this relates to see how this is really interesting here because this whole issue relates back to the model 19 you remember with the Model 19, this is a K-frame. So when they started boosting this up to 357, there were issues where this is a this is a 19-2. So this is an older one. I believe this is 61. What is the let me see, 1963? This one is. So if this is 1963. And this also has the uh, that ring attached to the cylinder. Now, supposedly, they moved it from the cylinder to the yoke, the other way around. And when they did that, it changed the relationship here of the gap between. They call this this the this, the um, barrel flat they call it. Can you see that on there? Hold on. Let me move this for a second. Let me get this in one spot. Let me zoom in really close. Let me get some extra light on here. So down at the bottom of the forcing cone, they call that the cylinder flat. See that over there? See now I'm using both hands and I can't we're looking right here, right underneath here. So I'm going to tilt it a little bit. Take a look over there. You'll see, see that flat spot right there? That was a big deal. That really mattered a lot. Let me get in over here. Here, you could see it better there. See that flat spot on the bottom? Now that flat spot, it made it, it made it thinner it made it thinner in this area here. Right in here, it made it thinner and they were getting cracks here. One of the main reasons, see this is thicker here, but when they moved this ring from here to the yoke, now when this closed, they had to have they had to have more space for this to close. And when they needed more space here, they had to make that flat deeper into the forcing cone. When they did that, they made this space here even thinner and they were getting cracks here. So I started looking into all of that now and I'm spending like the video's done and over already on this Model 19, but now I'm going into an area where I'm understanding where that problem was. And here's the Model 10 again. 
and uh, you can see this closes and it doesn't need that wider gap. There is a there is a flat here, same as the Model 19, but it's very small. And it hardly makes this forcing cone ring here any thinner on the bottom. So, yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure about NYPD's change here. Like if they, if they did change this ring, I couldn't find any information on whether the Model 10s, 10-6 to 10-7, when they supposedly changed the ring, if that had any change to the depth of the barrel flat. Um, I couldn't find out any information on that. There was just a ton of information on, on the Model 19 about that, but not on the uh, Model 10. So that was a little... I, I, it made me really start tearing this, tearing into this thing. And I found that back pine here, there were numbers, right? And those numbers match the C-series serial number here. So the ejector rod, and I think they call this the star or something, this is original. Um, and there are no numbers that I could see anywhere on the cylinder itself. Right, so I wouldn't know if the cylinder was changed out, but the ejector rod matches the serial number. And in here, over here, we have a uh, assembly number, a star, and an E. And uh, and that's it. There's no other stampings here besides you know the model 10-6 in here. So i heard that there would be like an r if there was like a replacement so that if this was a replacement they would stamp an r but maybe that was smith and wesson you know nypd they have their own armorers um and uh, they they make their own changes I, I don't think they need smith and wesson unless it's like uh you know warranty issues or something like that um they can uh, they definitely delved into guns and made their own changes to, to everything but whether it be like I said, the trigger pull or, or any other things, they make their own uh, their own changes, what kind of sights could be on the guns, all kinds of things like that. So they might not have stamped anything. And uh, just getting into that whole forcing cone barrel flat thing was very interesting, but it, it severely affected these guys. So now I realize well, if you're going to get a Model 19... There was a period where they moved that ring forward onto the yoke. And then there was a period where they went back again. But when they went back again, because they were getting, this was too thin here. When they went back again, they never changed the barrels back to this thicker size. So just accidentally by having a 19-2 was actually a good thing because it has the the less of a cut to the barrel flat and the thicker barrel, thicker forcing cone that were the, were the least problematic ones. And they say with these, if you stick to 38 special for most of the time, it's like a weird kind of like direction for when you buy a gun is like, yes, use the lower powered ammo most of the time. Because, you know, when I, then when I really need it to be more powerful, I don't want to have to worry that it's going to blow up. You know what I mean? So it's a silly thing to say. Only use the more powerful rounds right at that moment where it's like life or death and you really need it. It's like if I'm going to if I'm gonna speed this thing a steady diet of 38 specials and I feel confident with it, that's what I'm going to use all the time. I'm not just going to like when this shit hits the fan, I'm all of a sudden going to step up to like a, uh, you know, more powerful ammunition. That's not going to happen. Well, yeah, so the the book, we could have, we could have poked around in the book. I could have found some. This is Roy Jinks, History of Smith & Wesson. No thing of importance will come without effort. But uh, yeah, this book, I'll tell you, it doesn't really get into like modern guns until three quarters of the way through this book. Here's the uh, Smith & Wesson 
hand uh, ejector first model, sometimes called the model of 1899. There it is. And then uh, here he goes through all kinds of changes. I might get my answers about that uh, about that uh, ring there somewhere along in here. But yeah, there's a lot of uh, Smith & Wesson here. Smith & Wesson model 10-6. 38 military and police heavy barrel. So I guess, so this is the heavy barreled one then, I suppose. I didn't know that either. I didn't know whether that was either. So here, 10 6. Model 10 engineering changes. Hmm, doesn't say anything here about. Model 10 there, 6. Oh, but you know what? This book is so old. I don't think... I think the 10 there, 6 was the newest model when this book came out. Let's see what the... Uh, yeah, this is a 1977 book, so... We don't know what the 10 there, 7 was because it wasn't even invented yet. They hadn't even made that change yet. So that's certainly not going to talk about that ring. I wish I could remember what it's called. <laughs> it's really bothering me. You guys are probably screaming at the screen. But uh, I think my brain... My brain just, like, was just looking into that too much. I never really wrote it down. But, uh, yeah, I would say... I would say that uh, NYPD updated this. That I mean, that's... that's Because I'm, I'm sure I'm reading that the 10-7 in 1977 moved it from the yoke to the cylinder. So if that's the case, they had to change the yoke and the cylinder, but not necessarily the ejector rod. The ejector rod might have been able to stay. They wouldn't change anything that they didn't need to. But the yoke, obviously, if they moved it from the yoke to the cylinder, they'd have to change it. And uh, that's the case. So does this look like it's a different patina than the rest of the gun? The yoke part right here? Maybe a little bit. Maybe. This may just look a tiny bit shinier than the rest of it. That is a good point. I didn't really thought to look into that, but maybe, maybe in 1977 they made that change. And this guy would have been about halfway, a little... A little less than halfway through his career, so. Hmm. Beautiful, though, right? I mean, just the, the patina is perfect. Now, the question is, though, do I, uh, you know, I never took a Smith & Wesson revolver apart. Only a little bit. I, I took a, taken a couple of, uh, you know, this screw right here takes out the, uh, it takes out the uh, the cylinder, and it, this slides out. I've done that before, but that's nothing. And this screw, this isn't one that you, like, really hammer down because of that. You just kind of, like, snug it, because it just kind of screws into, like, a recess in this, uh, in this part that runs through here that has the uh, cylinder assembly here connected to it. This whole assembly has a rod that goes in, in here. And it's kind of like the screw just goes into a recess. You don't really want to pound it down. It just snugs to hold it in place, basically. And uh, if you tighten it too much, it won't it won't move properly. Uh, this screw, and there's another one under the grip, I believe. Those have to come out. This side plate, the reason why, uh, you know, I never took one apart is because these side plates, that one you could just, for fun, take apart, put back together. You want to kind of try to minimize the amount of time you take these side plates apart because the amount of times because look at how how they fit they're like a, a perfect fit you know and this this screw is fitted to the gun each specific gun so you don't want to interchange that with the others and i think these two are different sizes so like literally every single screw that comes out you want to catalog where it goes and then there's guides that show how to take apart the inside. There's a couple of tricky springs that you sort of need special tools for. And I'm not even sure. You know what? Let me take a quick look in here. I saw some guy made a tool. Is this 
this is my um, my Wheeler uh, screwdriver set. Looks like this. And there's a tool in here. This. I think this is to put. Let me see. Is it listed up here? Yeah. Smith & Wesson rebound spring. That's what this is for. Somebody made one of these tools uh, online and it looked like this. And I was like, I have that. It's in my kit. So that's what this is for. Somehow it pushes and holds that spring in there. Well, you know, maybe we'll do that. Maybe we'll do a video where we go in here and clean it all up. And I mean, it feels smooth enough. It's smooth as silk. But I'm sure it's all creaky and dirty in there. It'd be nice to have it just really clean, knowing that it's all clean and oiled and mint. And then you could like carding wheel the outside of this and get rid of any blemishes. But you know, and you could replace the grips. And it's like, but what? There's no, there's no restoration needed. This is what I bought it for. I bought it to to look like this. All right. Not going to change anything about how it looks. But I think I'll go inside and just clean it all up inside. I just want to have fun taking it apart and putting it back together, I think. I think I want to do that. I'm going to do it with you on a video. And just to know that inside is all nice and... All nice and ballast-alled and clean. Functioning perfectly. I think we'll do that. Anyway, so that's uh, that's my version of a Smith & Wesson Model 10 video. I hope I didn't forget anything. Uh, sometimes I go through my pictures that I pull for the video. I usually pull the pictures first, then I go through the pictures and and uh, add them to the video as I'm as I'm editing it. And sometimes I see a picture and I go, "Oh, you you forgot to talk about that." If I did. I'm just going to throw those pictures up right now in the outro and um, just count it as something I didn't talk about. And uh, that's that. So, yeah, there's been a little bit of a break. I apologize. Uh, it's not a YouTube break this time. They're actually being pretty cool. They demonetized a couple of things here and there with absolutely no reason. Don't know why, but, uh, but they're being okay. Uh, just this winter is being kind of uh, brutal over here. This is just a lot of uh, a lot of nonsense going on this winter, and uh, employment has uh, you know pulled a lot of my free time away from me. But it's nice. It's the weather's getting warmer. We're into February here, and uh, you start to smell spring around the corner. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm hoping to get to the range a lot this year. There's a lot of I have like a bunch of I have stuff that I haven't even shot yet. I mean, it's crazy. Like like that like in acquisitions over the last year that I haven't even been to the range with. And that is inexcusable. And some of them, you know, I've done videos up over here, so uh, I could do a nice range video I'm trying to get a friend to uh be my cameraman. It's really difficult to get someone to be your cameraman these days. Everybody's all into social media and staring at screens. You can't get out into the real world with anybody. But uh, whatever, if I got a tripod up, I'll tripod up and uh, bring you some uh, bring you some action. But this yeah, this spring, I'm definitely getting out there. I don't care. That's uh, that's that's definite. That's a promise. And until then, you all take care, and uh, I'll see you on the next one. Yeah, Zach, ah!